I got a lot of things on my mind this morning, a lot of good things. I feel like the Lord allowed me to go to the fire hydrant and like open the fire hydrant and then he just let the water just spill all over me. And so it's kind of uh, going to be one of those days where I have to cut some things here and there uh, and add some things that I wasn't planning on adding. But I'm excited to be here. I wanted to start by saying I am grateful to be here. I am grateful for you guys allowing me to spend time with you and to share our lives with you and our family with you. Um, I don't take that for granted. I don't feel like I earned that. I don't feel like that's something I deserve. Uh, every time I get to speak and to be part of your lives in this spiritual fashion, I'm grateful to God for the life that he has given me and the life that he took me out of, uh, that he gave me a hope and a dream and a vision and he gave me love and he gave me something to give to other people because I had nothing. And so I am grateful and I appreciate each and every one of you and I am so happy to be here and to see you today. So thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for loving me too. I think I'll pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for being our rock. You are the secure place that all of us can stand in when the world is in turmoil. Lord, you are our anchor. You are the one who gives us sure foundation. The world tries to give us things that give us money and position and jobs and health. And they try all different types of things to manipulate the gifts that you originally gave uh, to give us uh, a focus. But the real focus comes from you. The real security comes from you. Every good and perfect and precious thing we have and we desire, everything we seek after, you're the originator, you're the creator, you are the one who put it into the spin. And so, Lord, we give you the credit and the honor that you are due, and we lift up your name, and we sanctify you, and we worship you, and we praise you, and we say we love you, God. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you are, you are so capable of ministering to each one of us in our different ways, because we're all so distinct. We're all so different. We all have different needs, desires, wants, joys. And yet, Lord, you just know how to minister to all of it simultaneously, magnificently, and without anything lacking. God, we ask you to meet us here today in a special way. Spur us on, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Speak to us. God, help us to break the chains that have us bound. Help us to step out in a faith that we've never experienced. God, instill in us an injection of faith that can move in a way to allow your spirit to do things that it's been longing to do in this city for a long time. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I, uh, a couple of the thoughts that hit me this morning, and, and one of them I, I woke up with. A lot of times, I don't know if you ever do this, but uh, maybe go to bed praying or go to bed reading a book or reading the Bible or uh, in the midst of your dreaming, uh, I sometimes will, oftentimes I do this, I say, God, just speak to me. I want to hear from your voice. Sometimes in my waking moments, I'm not as clear and I'm not as able to hear what you want to say. So God, if you would speak to me in, in my prayers, uh, in my sleep, in my dreams. And this morning, as I was kind of in that groggy state between awake and asleep, the Lord was sharing with me thoughts that I thought were interesting and that that is every action of God is fresh and life-giving and unique. Everything God does is unique. Every blade of grass he puts on the planet is unique. Every person is unique. God doesn't create anything. He, he's not a conveyor belt that spits it out the same over and over again. What example in the Bible demonstrates God ever doing something the same way twice? Even when we look at what God does and, and how he feeds people and how he gives them water from a rock or how he speaks to them or every demonstration of the uh, interaction of God with man is unique. Every time he, he switches his methods up. When does he ever do the same thing twice? And yet God asks man to imitate him, but he imitates no one. 
God doesn't imitate anyone. Everything comes from him through his creative juices as unique and distinct and original. But then when he comes to us, he asks us to imitate him. And so I was chewing on that and thinking how magnificent that was. Another thing entered my mind, and this entered my mind at the movie theater as uh, David and I stole it away for a date on Thursday or Wednesday or whenever it was. And uh, it was spur of the moment. Alex asked me, I'm not sure why. He said, did you plan that? And I said, no. And I almost felt ashamed that I hadn't planned it, but it was spur of the moment. <laughs> But we went to Thomas House for dinner, which is something I'd never done, you know. We'd only done Thomas House for breakfast with the kids a lot of times, but went for Thomas House for dinner, and that was pretty good. And then we decided to go to Grammy's for ice cream, and you know, Tommy's wondering, what did you do to your wife that you had to make up for her all, you know? <laughs> and then after that, we were like, let's go to the movies. So we went to the movies, and we watched uh, Father Stew, which is a movie about this Catholic priest and how he got there. Uh, he was a boxer, and he was, it was, a, it was a movie about conversion. And, uh, you know, setting doctrine aside, it was a powerful movie about a life changed. And during the previews of the movie, they have these advertisements, and one was for the movie coming called Elvis. And this is not a, a shameless commercial for the movie, but <laughs> most of the kids of this generation don't even know who Elvis was. But... For me growing up, my brother and some of you guys, we all knew who Elvis was. Elvis was a, a famous singer. He was on top of the game. But here's the quote that hit me in the movie. Elvis says, A reverend once told me, The things that are too dangerous to say, sing. Wow. And I thought, wow, that's intense. You know? There, during that era that Elvis lived, you know, um, Martin Luther King was assassinated, John F. Kidney was assassinated, and the speech of men was really put on the chopping block. And it made a very distinct preacher if he could actually speak the things that he wanted to speak because the political environment was so ramped up and so explosive that a lot of the pulpits became quiet. And they wouldn't speak. They were basically having their tongues held and, and being told, don't speak. And that even came up in Bible study this morning. It was very interesting. Uh, and so uh, that little piece of advice this guy was giving Elvis, what preachers can't preach, you need to sing. And some of you know, and Elvis in his early career was a gospel singer. And we know where that eventually went, but that's... That, and again, it wasn't a commercial for Elvis, but it was just a thought process about how we can enter a, a, a moment in time in which um, men are not able to preach what they need to preach, or people are not able to teach what they're supposed to teach, or, where the, uh, the tongue is getting a pair of handcuffs put on it, and teachers and schools are told they can't teach the Bible or bring their religion, or, or people are told what they can say or what they can't say. And I really think you here at Acorn because I have never felt like I couldn't just preach what I wanted to preach. None of you have ever come up to me after service and said, bro, you shouldn't breach that area or that topic. Um, and I, so I want to be grateful to God and to you for the freedom of this pulpit. And I pray that it always remains that way. Amen. Um, another thought that crossed my mind since I'm not getting into the sermon at all, I'm playing like David. I'm just letting the overflow of my heart go. Uh, it's time for us to take it to the next level. Um, God's been stirring at Acorn. It's been an amazing year and a so, a year and so, whatever year and a half or it's been. And uh, God is doing things. Um, but it's time for us to reach into our souls and to rejuvenate that faith and that dream and that desire to see God move in your lives personally. I don't think any of us want to just embark on a journey into religion. We want to experience God in a personal way, in a relationship that changes our lives. The only thing that ever drew me to Jesus was transform lives. It was meeting people who had been in darkness, who came into light, and nobody could explain it. It was people whose lives had drastically changed into a, a, a picture of Christ. 
and they were dark people. Some of them were evil people. Some of them were mean people. And when I saw the transformed lives, that was when I desired Jesus. When I saw that, hey, of all people uh, of the world that try to change lives, they try to do it through education. They try to do it through wealth. They try to do it through jobs or experiences or travel. But I had seen how faulty that could be. And yet when I experienced people who had had lives changed by the power of the Spirit of Christ, it was real and it was significant and it was impacting and it was luring to me as what I wanted. And that's what drew me to Jesus was his life-changing power. And I think that's what draws us all to Jesus, really. And, and religion can kill that. Religion can creep in and begin to place itself as this is the way you are supposed to behave and set of rules. And I don't want to make religion itself an evil term. It is used in the book of James and he talks about pure religion. But, but there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 3.6 I was thinking about this morning. It says, the letter kills but the spirit gives life. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. What does it mean? It means sometimes we can let the Word of God become so legalistic and so uh, ingrained in us that we are so set on obeying it that we lose the Spirit of it. And that's not to make the law or the Word evil, because I think any of you that know me know that I love the Bible. I don't know anybody that loves the Bible as much as I do. I don't mean that arrogantly, but I love it that much. I, I read it. I desire it. I mean, if you stuck me on an island for a year and told me that I could read the Bible, I would be happy. I would be like, yes, this is great. I'm stuck on an island with the Word of God. And so I love the Word. But the Word absent the Spirit kills. Without the Spirit of God moving in you and motivating you and helping you to unlock what it means and God's intentions, it becomes so legalistic and so heavy that it kills you. It squashes your spirit. It kills your dream. It stumps out faith. It condemns you. And so we've got to be sure that we're tuned into God's Spirit as we read his commands, as we hear his commands, as, as he unfolds his word to us, we've got to make sure that we understand the heart of God and the spirit of God. And that's why he gave his spirit to us so that he could write his law upon our hearts. It wouldn't be outside of us. It would be inside of us. And that when we would hear the directives and the commands of God, that it would come from within us. And that's so important uh, as we want to grow in Christ that we capture his spirit. Without the spirit, religion is, is dead. Without the Holy Spirit, the Bible becomes a rule book that none of us can follow. And so it's very, very, very important that we chase after the spirit. Uh, and the spirit is guaranteed to us. The Father wants to give us the Spirit. The Bible says that that's His desire. It's not something that He's trying to withhold from us. But one thing is clear is that the Spirit and the Spirit of the world, the Spirit and the devil cannot dwell together because the Spirit is light and everything else is darkness. And obviously light can't be in the same place as darkness. So we're looking at a passage in, in Numbers chapter 20 in which... Moses is going to strike the rock, and if you were here last week, we touched on it. I talked about hardened hearts, and we talked about a time in Exodus chapter 17 where Moses struck the rock. But in this story, it's not the same story we're going to discover. It's a different story. It's years later, and Moses again strikes the rock. But before we get there, I'm going to sing, and I never sing, so this is... Uh, and it's a song that came on my heart, and I, I just love it. And I wonder if anybody in here has ever heard it. Whew. I don't sing. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart I'll agree and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Has anybody ever heard that? Come on, Dad, let's go. 
<laughs> Nobody has ever, uh, Roberta heard it? Millions heard it? I mean, but I don't know who's saying it. Uh, uh, a job and come be your agent. <laughs> 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 yeah, what, what, come on, Dad. Uh, it came out of the 80s. It was a gospel singer. I think she has the name Caesar, either a first name or last name. Don't remember. Anyway, very powerful. What does it speak to me? It speaks that I'm going to open my ears and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lead me and guide me. I'm going to say yes when he says to do something. I'm not going to quench the spirit. I'm going to key in, you know. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 10, which we brought up last week, uh, there's a passage. We're going to basically be in Numbers 20, but I want to bring up the 1 Corinthians 10 passage first. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says, For I do not, Paul says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud. Remember, the cloud led them in the wilderness, okay? They were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. Remember, when they came out of slavery, they crossed the Red Sea. And that was the symbol of, of their, their baptism. It says they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The cloud is the Holy Spirit, all right? And so they crossed the waters and they were baptized into a new life. They were born again. They were taken from the slavery of the old life in Egypt and brought into a new life. And the destiny was the promised land. They all ate the same spiritual food. They ate the manna, the bread of wor the word of God. They, they, they were supplied daily with it. And they drank the same spiritual drink, the water of life, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. So God kept bringing them water, and, and, and miraculously, he brought this water to them out of a rock. I mean, if there's anything impossible, uh, that would seem impossible. And I think that's why God did it that way. You just don't get water from a rock. But in the wilderness, that's the way he did it. And Paul tells us and shares with us the spiritual revelation that God gave him is that that rock was Christ himself. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies were scattered over the desert. And we're going to learn about that. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So... Paul tells us that these things in the Old Testament that we read are our examples so that we won't repeat the same mistakes. We won't set our hearts on evil things. And so often times in that wilderness journey, if you remember, that people would reflect and they would think back on Egypt. In Egypt, we had leeks and onions. In Egypt, we had this. In Egypt, we had that. And it's as if the newborn Christian is saying, back when I wasn't saved, I had this. And back when I wasn't saved, I had that. And, and before I made a commitment to Jesus, I had that. And why does God deprive me of those things? And they set their hearts on the evil things of their past. And so that's why Paul is saying these are good stories to remember. He goes on to say, do not be idolaters. They began to idolize things they weren't supposed to idolize. They were idolizing food. They were idolizing uh, what they perceived their life was like. They began to idolize all kinds of things in the wilderness. Later, he says, we should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. He talks about how these stories are good so that we'd learn not to test the Lord the same way they tested the Lord. And then he goes on in verse 10, he says, and, and do not grumble as some of them did. And, and, and he talks about how they grumbled in their journey and how that grumbling them got them in trouble. And, and then he goes on in verse 11 and he says, these were warnings written for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. These stories, these happenings that happen in the Old Testament are fulfilled in you, he says. They're warnings, they're, they're examples for us to learn from and to grow from. And he says in verse 12, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And so a lot of people ask me, and they still do it, I, I get persecuted sometimes for my knowledge of the Old Testament. I read a, ch a chapter like this in, in 1 Corinthians 10, and I think, wow, you don't even know the New Testament if you think the Old Testament needs to be displaced in your life. Because the messages that God wants to get to you are revealed there. The warnings, the way to walk, the way to be, the way to understand his heartbeat, to see his grace, to understand his love, to experience his forgiveness and his long suffering. They're encrypted in the Old Testament stories for us to unpeel and unpack. And Paul does it all through the Bible. He unpacks it over and over again. And I love it. And that's why when I'm in the New Testament and there's an Old Testament quote, I almost always go there. Ask Richard. We can't seem to get through the book of Hebrews. We've been studying it for 14 years, I think. 
And it's because Hebrews quotes about every verse there is in the Old Testament. And so I'm like, okay, let's go back here and let's go back there. And we have a great time. And I appreciate Richard's long suffering with me. And honestly, I think he enjoys it as much as I do. So it's good. So that's why we're here. We're in Numbers chapter 20 because we want all those lessons that Paul was talking about in that chapter about the rock and that rock is Christ. And so we've come a full circle in this uh, story because last week we saw that Moses had got uh, these spies together and he had sent them out to spy out the land and the uh, spies came back with, uh, all of them came back with a good report, right? <laughs> no. Two came back with a good report. Ten came back and said, we can't enter the land. Okay. And so what do the people decide to do? Did they decide to follow the advice of the ten or the two? Ten. ten. And that's the way the public usually generates is the people go with the majority. It takes a righteous, indignant, fervent, faith-filled, strong-willed person to sometimes stand against the crowd and do what is right despite the fact that the majority is saying another voice. Okay, And so those two people that were left, that were the good ones, that had the faith to enter into the promised land, anybody remember their names? Go ahead, just shout it out. Go, buddy. The younger your voice, the more I hear it. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb. Okay, Joshua and Caleb, they had faith. And, and as a result of this, this incident, uh, that they didn't have faith to enter the promised land, I mean, here was God providing for them back and forth in so many miraculous ways. They had seen their lives set free from Egypt. They were not slaves anymore. They were free men and free women. Even though God had delivered them in such powerful way, they didn't have the faith to enter the promised land. And so what did God, what did God tell them? You're going to die in the wilderness. You're going to die in the wilderness. And he, 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 he spoke it mostly of the adults, the ones over 20. He said... Uh, you guys, because you, you said that I brought you out into the wilderness to kill you. you they said, Moses, why did you bring us out here? Did you bring us out here to kill us and our children? Grumble, grumble, grumble. grumble. And so God says, okay, that's exactly what we're going to do. <laughs> Except not your children. I'm going to save the next generation for me. I'm going to let that older generation die out here. You're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then I am going to uh, raise up a new generation in your kids. Amen. So if we can get the slide to change, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> My slide changer. Wake up, FedEx. <laughs> all right. So this all happened. This, they, they crossed the Red Sea. And they get to this place called Kadesh Barnea. And when they're in Barnea, that's where Moses sends out the spies. That's where they come back. They get the report. And so that's what's significant about this place called Kadesh. Okay? It wasn't originally called Kadesh. Moses and the crew name it Kadesh. Kadesh comes from a Hebrew word, Kadosh, which means holy. And it has to do with God's holiness. And if you know anything about holiness, to be holy means to be separated. So when you're holy, you're separated for a distinct purpose. God desires to make his people holy. He desires to make you holy. He wants to take you out and use you not for common purpose, but for a separate purpose. When God puts his Holy Spirit in you, it's because he wants to make you holy. And that means because he wants to give you a set-apart life. He wants to make you distinct, not like everyone else on the planet. Although he'd love to save the whole world, believe me, he'd like to save everybody on the planet. But it takes a special and unique person to kind of cross that bridge of faith and one day step out and say, Lord, I'm listening. I am starting to believe what you have spoken and I want to know more. And he grabs that person and he grabs that faith in them and he brings them over and he says, I want to make you holy. My first instructions for you are. And you begin to repent and you make a covenant with him in baptism and he fills you with the Holy Spirit and he separates you from the rest of the world. Just like he did with these people. He separated them from their worldly life in Egypt. He brought them across the rivers as Paul explained to us. They were all baptized unto Moses and they were led by the Spirit in the wilderness. And so they get to Barnea, and God is disappointed. He's heartbroken. He is hurt. Sometimes it's hard for us to imagine that God could be hurt because we think foreknowledge somehow um, 
irons out his ability to be hurt. Uh, Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, some people have been seared as with a hot iron. Their consciences are, are so seared that they don't have shame anymore. They don't have any sense. They don't feel any guilt. And, and so some people, unconsciously, they, they believe that because God knows that it's going to happen in advance, that he doesn't attach his emotions to it. But there are scriptures even in the Bible that talk about God and, and some of the things that Israel do, did in, in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, a couple of places it says, God says, I did not even fathom that you would do this or that. Another place he says, it was never my intention that you would do this or that. And it's not to take away of the fact that he had foreknowledge. It's just that God put emotions in you so that you would understand him. He created you in his image. And so here we are at this place, and, and God is hurt because he's given them so much, and they're not ready to go the next level. They took the get out of slavery card, but they weren't ready for the walk in victory card. Oh, wow. And so here they were in the wilderness, and God's like, well, I'm going to leave you in the wilderness then because I'm going to have to do this. I've got to get a people that will walk in the victory in the dream that I have, and so I'm going to raise up the second generation to do this. But meanwhile, they wander in this wilderness for 40 years with all kinds of stories that we can read in Exodus and Deuteronomy, a little bit in Leviticus and some in Numbers. Some people think the whole book of Numbers is just full of Numbers and they miss this story because it's not written anywhere else. Pieces of it are mentioned throughout the Bible, but it's right here in Numbers chapter 20. So the 38 years have gone by and they're right back at the same place. And that's what we're going to read. Okay, so I wanted you to get this background of why Kadesh is, is, is important. It's important because it's where the journey stopped. And now, 38 years later, it's where the journey could start, could start again. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zen, and they stayed at Kadesh. There, Miriam died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert, that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs and grapevines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Then Moses set, raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. Wow. This is different than the other one, and, and, and I, we're going to kind of compare the two a little bit to uh, help you come to speed with that. But what I want you to understand is that this is a new generation. And so even though it was, it was fresh on the minds of Moses, j just think about it. Moses had a, had a calling, and the calling in Moses' life was to rescue a large group of people and bring them into the promised land. And that calling came to an abrupt stop because of their lack of faith. That calling came to an abrupt stop because of their grumbling, their complaining, because they, they, they came out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them. Wow. Okay, So that calling had... had uh, a purpose. And so when God spoke at that first occurrence at Kadesh and said, because of your rebellion, you are going to wander in this wilderness for 40 years for the 40 days you've been grumbling and you are not going to come out of it. Only the next generation is going to come out of it. 
It must have been hard for Moses. I would imagine that was extremely difficult for Moses to know that God had trained him, raised him in the desert and brought him to that moment only to find out that he's going to spend another 40 years in the wilderness. He had already spent 40 years in the wilderness after killing the Egyptian. Another story. So Moses, when this all landed on him, was 80 years old and he's in his old age prime going for it wants to enter the promised land sees great victory parts the red sea sees the miraculous power of god the fire by night and the cloud by day and he's leading this massive amount of people and god seems to be with him and then boom it stops because faith stops and he has to embrace the idea that god just said okay we get to spend another 40 years here so when we land here again in Numbers chapter 20, Moses is 120 years old. He's an old man and he's waited a long time. And I bet you anything, he was eager. I would imagine he was like, wow, we've come this far. We're going in now. This is going to be great. Okay. And so when they began to grumble, it was like PTSD. It was flashback city. I can't believe it. And what's interesting is, is this is not the same grumbling crew. Yeah. This is the second generation grumbling. This is the young ones. It's as if the sins of the fathers had been passed on to the sons. It's as if that 40 years in the wilderness, the older generation had contaminated the younger generation. And we even see a hint of it a little bit here and there in the different aspects of their complaint, uh, which we'll see in the next slide, but don't go there yet. One just prophetic thing I want to slip in for, for minds that like these, and so this is commercial break. Anybody needs to think about work or sports or anything like that, this is your moment. <laughs> in this moment, Miriam dies. In this chapter, Aaron dies. And then in the end, Moses is going to die also. In the Bible, Moses is seen as, as the giver of the law. Aaron is seen as, as the priesthood. And Miriam is seen as the prophetess. So in this chapter, we're going to see the end of the law, the prophets, and the priesthood. And it's going to be led to a new generation. A new person is going to step in. Anybody know who that is? Joshua, and he's going to lead them into the promised land. Joshua's name in Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua. Who else's name in Hebrew is Yeshua? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. So the law, the prophets, and the priests are buried. And a new leader comes in. His name is Yeshua. And he's going to lead them to the promised land. The Bible is so rich with this type of prophetic imagery that when you begin to see it and it comes into your mind and you realize it, there is no way you wouldn't believe in the New Testament. There is no way when your eyes begin to see how God embedded so many prophetic revelations in each chapter and pages and places, you just, your brain explodes with, wow, God, you knew it from the beginning. The story's been written. And so when it comes to having faith, when God begins to open your mind like that, faith gets easier, but obedience gets harder. And so that's what we want to talk about for a moment is, is comparing the complaints. Uh, basically, that was the comparison. You've been looking at that. Grab me the next slide. The complaints. Okay. So these complaints are distinct. They're a little bit different. First, they say, if we had only died when our brothers fell before the Lord. The first generation didn't talk about dying. They just wanted to get back to Egypt. Matter of fact, when they highlighted the benefits of Egypt, it was the leeks, the onions, all this cool produce they had, a different life there, you know. But this group it says, if only we had died when our brothers fell before the Lord. And as we look at the language and, and the word death and, and things in Hebrew, we actually find that there's only one other place in the Bible where those specific terms are used in that way. And it has to do with this rebellion called Korah's rebellion. It was a point in time, and, and maybe I'll just do a sermon on that one day, but it was a point in time in which the people of Israel began to raise up and said to Moses and Aaron, who made you leaders 
above us. We are all holy. What makes you so special? And it's funny because of all the people on the planet, Moses was the guy who would have easily not taken the job. <laughs> he was not a guy that wanted the job for its glory or its envy or he wanted to be that guy. He was dragged basically tooth and nail a lot of the times. There were times when God uh, would talk to, to Moses and, 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 and tell Moses, you know, with Moses is like, Lord, I stutter and I got this problem and who, they, you know, they, da, da, da. And, and God is like, get up, Moses. And he doesn't let Moses make excuses not to lead, Tommy. <laughs> yeah. I love you. Yeah. But this rebellion ended up in the earth splitting open and swallowing up the rebellious ones. And these people in this next generation are saying, it would have been better for us to die, to be swallowed up in the rebellion, to have been with the crew that left, the, the crew that questioned the authority, the crew that went the other direction. It would have been better for us to die with them, to sit here and just be f drow uh, uh, thirsty to death. What do they call it? <laughs> parched. Parched. So parched that we're going to die. Why did you bring us out here and our livestock to die? This place has no grain. Well, that's never been said before. That, that, that wasn't part of the old generation's complaint. Grain. The word there in Hebrew, it has to do with the... It, this place has no ability. This soil has no ability to be sown in. We can't plant seeds in this soil. This soil is corrupt. It's desert soil. It's dry soil. It's worthless soil. We can't even grow cops in here. We cannot grow a harvest in this kind of soil. We can't plant seeds here. This soil is hard. It's a different kind of complaint. And then they say there's no figs, and there's no grapevines, and there's no pomegranates. Well, there's no figs, grapevines, or pomegranates that are projected as being popular in Egypt either. So where did they get this figs, grapevines, and pomegranates? They got it from Numbers 13, 23. It was the report of the spies. When the spies came back from the promised land, they had that big pole. You ever see those pictures like this one here? And, and, and there's grapes. We usually see the grapes. But the fact is there were also pomegranates and there were um, figs. figs. Thank you according to Numbers 13, 23. And so it was the symbol of, of, of the prosperity. It was the symbol of the blessings. It was the symbol of the free land called Canaan. And this group of people, this new generation is like, you've been promising, promising us or telling us about the promised land for 38 years. How come we couldn't have just gone in it 10 years ago? Why did we have to go this far? Why do we have to wander around in this wilderness? How come we had to have these difficulties? Why did you make me suffer for the last generation? Why do the fathers eat grapes and the son's teeth rot out? Why do I have to pay for the sins of my forefathers? You've been promising us the land of figs and grapevines and pomegranates but you've left us out here to die. And by the way, there's no water. I think at this point, that's the PTSD I'm talking about with Moses. He's a little shook up. He's a little bit like, man, this feels just like it did 38, 40 years ago. And maybe, I'm just making this up, but maybe he's a little bit afraid that God is going to say, okay, another 40 years. At any rate, he hits his face, which I like. I like the fact that it says him and Aaron went back to the tent of meeting and they went on their face. Have you ever prayed like that? Yes, Get on your face. Like a lot of us, we... We've got our noble way of praying, you know, at the bedside, and that's great. There's plenty of kneeling scriptures, but there's a time in your life sometimes when you're just laying down. 
you're in your spiritual altar in your place, wherever it is, you're just laying on your face. You are prostrate before God and you're crying out to him in the sincerity of your heart saying, Lord, at whatever it is. And this is where these guys are. They're, they're at a place where they're praying to God and seeking his face in the greatest position of humility, a position of terror, uh, uh, probably a position of fear, a position of reverence. And they're crying out to God, and the glory of God falls on them, it says. Wow, how that is amazing. When God sweeps in with his glory and he gives you uh, the hairs on the back of your neck flying up in strange places. He, he makes your arms feel light all of a sudden, and, and you feel the presence of God, and, and, and you know that he's listening. That alone is amazing. And most of the time at that point, when I feel the presence of God, I, and I know he's listening, I, I also come to this point where I don't care what your answer is, Lord. It's like I move into a point where I'm like, wow, God, whatever you want is what I want. At the point when I know he's listening to me, I just want his will. His will is good, pleasing, and perfect. And in his presence, it's just like, wow, Father, just, I don't even want to leave this spot. And whatever I came there for it almost seems forgotten because I'm in his presence. If you haven't had that, find it. That is available. That's real Christianity, not religion. It's not telling you how to pray. It's experiencing God in your prayers. And so there they are, and the glory of God falls on them, and, and God gives instructions. And so God says, get up and grab the people. In the last time, 38 years ago, God told Moses, get up and grab your elders. Which is an interesting sort of shift. Okay. This time he says, I want you to grab the people and get the rod and go hit the rock twice. What did he tell him? Speak to the rock. So Moses does it. He gets up, he gets the rod, he gathers the people, he gets there, and who's the first one he speaks to? He speaks to the people. He says, you bunch of rebels! He is hot, mad, ready. Do we have to bring water out of this rock? And then he smacks the rock once and twice. He lost it. God gives the people water. Why? He loves those people. It's another generation. Not dealing the same way with that generation as he dealt with the last one. The issues they have are different. And so he's faithful and he gives them the water anyway. Quick story. I worked at uh, Thrifty's. It was a kind of ace hardware place and I was an ice cream scooper. I was 16. I had the, you know, barbering makes your hand grip strong, but their ice cream scooper had like a spring lever where you'd turn it in and go like this and you got the strongest grip. I could whoop you, Alex. <laughs> I could whoop him. I had the strongest grip for a 16-year-old. And so, this guy, but there were two layers of ice cream. The top layer, which was soft generally, and then there was the bottom layer that you had brought out, or I had brought out from the walking-in freezer that was freezing cold. It didn't matter if it was 150 degrees outside. When you worked in the freezer, you had to wear a parka because it was cold in there, and they froze their ice cream to rock-solid hard. And so I, myself, knew that the bottom layer of ice cream under the, so you had all your canisters of ice cream up, but the bottom layer is basically defrosting in a freezer, but defrosting. It's coming down from negative 500 degrees to maybe negative 32 or something. I don't know, but it's going to get softer eventually. And this guy came in and he wanted coconut pineapple. This is how bad I'm scarred because I still remember what kind of ice cream he wanted. I want coconut pineapple. And I said, sir, I'm sorry. The reason that's covered is because uh, we're all out of coconut pineapple. He said, I can see a box under the coconut pineapple. It's another box under there. It's brand new. I said, sir, the boxes under the boxes are still frozen, and I cannot uh, scoop that. It's too difficult. I want you to scoop me a double scoop of coconut pineapple. 
And I was like, sir, I'm not going to do that. I want to talk to your manager. We had at Thrifties, we had these cool microphones. You press the button and it goes all over the store. I'd never used it because I'm from the ice cream department. <laughs> <laughs> I've got zero keys in my pocket. <laughs> manager to the ice cream department, please. Manager to the ice cream department. That probably had never been uttered <laughs> on the wires of that microphone. <laughs> commercial on the commercial. The manager was one of those who experienced the early beginnings of the Lord moving on my life. And so by that age, God had already moved on me enough that I was hosting a Bible study at which I was teaching and the manager was attending. So Greg comes, Greg Barlow, not my brother Greg, he comes to the ice cream department and he goes, what seems the problem? And I begin to speak and Greg's like silences me and asks the customer to speak as what you would expect. The customer says, I asked for coconut pineapple and your worker would not give it to me. And I see, I said, Greg, it's frozen. And I didn't scoop it because uh, you know it's frozen, Greg. I mean, like, that's why it's covered up. It's not available right now. I, hadn't, I didn't have time to take it down off the sign yet. And Greg kind of pushed me aside. He lifted up the empty box, pulled up the new fresh box of ice cream, took the empty box, flipped it upside down, put the fresh ice cream on the top, reached in his pocket, got the razor blade, cut the plastic lining off the top of the scoop, peeled that plastic off, got the scoop. It's in kind of warm water over here, gets it. And he puts his hand in there. He's struggling. He's getting out of his game. Got the cone. His whole <laughs> body shaking. <laughs> Amazingly, he gets a scoop. Because I didn't think you could get a scoop out. And he squeezes it on there. And then he goes down for another draw. Puts it on there. Oddly, he kind of tells the guy, no charge, sir. We're sorry for the inconvenience. I will talk with him. We will deal with that. Uh, this ice cream is on the house. Thank you, sir, for your patience. Hands him the ice cream. The guy takes the ice cream, walks out the door. Greg takes the scoop. He looks at me. He goes, Fisher! He throws the scoop, and it magically just sinks into the ice cream. I don't know why, but the ice cream was soft. But also, Greg backed my play. Yeah, wow. It was the weirdest thing because here I was in my defiance. I hadn't checked out what I thought. I had an imagination. I had preconceptions. I had a perception that wasn't correct. And when Greg came to deal with the situation, instead of embarrassing me in front of the people, instead of correcting me, instead of dealing anything with me, he went through the motions and even acted it out and struggled and acted like he was struggling. I mean, that ice cream was soft. You could scoop it out easily. But Greg backed me up, gave the customer stuff, and then he was like, Fisher! <laughs> and then he ripped me, you know. <laughs> God backed Moses' play. He gave the people water. Because God's bigger than your leader. God's operating, he uses leaders, he uses people to direct you, he uses a speaker, he uses a David, a, a Jeff, a, 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 a Tommy, a Richard, he uses people, but in the end, he is the one that will be glorified. And he's a little irritated at Moses because the miracle he wanted those people to see is that when I speak to a rock, it will go forth with water. All through the generations past, they had seen Moses operating with this rod as if it was some magical wand. He parted the Red Sea, shining that rod. Everything Moses practically did was with this rod. And it is very possible that the rod had become idolatrous, as if it was like as if the rod was there, then everything was going to be good. If the rod comes out, then we know it's going to be great. Our forefathers have told us all about the things that Moses did with that rod. Look, Moses has the rod. We're surely going to get water. And all God wanted to do is have Moses show up on the scene and say, bring forth water, rock, and the water would flow. Because God wanted to do something different. 
He didn't want to lead these people with the rod. He wanted to lead them with his word. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The law brings death without the Spirit. God wants to lead you with his word. He wants to open up a new opportunity through the power of his word. You've got to know his word to get there. You've got to familiarize yourself with his word. You've got to hear his word, cherish his word, long for it. In the most purest way of saying, lust after his word. Eagerly sit in the quiet place. You ever do this? You ever sit in a room where it's deathly quiet and just say, Lord, please speak to me. I want to hear what your voice would say. And I'm not saying that he's going to open up the clouds and bring down a shining light and tear the roof off and speak to you and make you go flat on your face because you're going to die if that happens. But I'm saying he's going to speak to your heart. He's going to speak to you through the power of his Holy Spirit. And he's going to guide you and lead you because you were able to quiet yourself before him. This happens while you're reading the word, too. There's a lot of times you're reading your word like, Lord, I have no idea what you're trying to show me here. And he says, quiet down a moment, read it again, and wait. And then read it again, if necessary, and wait. And would you read it again and wait? Or would you give up and say, God's not going to speak anything to me through this passage because I don't understand it. As the days are ahead here at Acorn, I feel very energetic and ready for a new thing. What do I mean by a new thing? I mean a new thing. Because that's how my God is. He just doesn't do things the same way. It's going to feel different. It's going to change us differently. It's going to be God. But in order for God to happen, a lot of us have got to get out of the way. Including Moses. In order for God to speak to the rock, Moses needed to chill and not have reflections of the past. How the past operated is the past. How the future operates is the future. God is big enough to deal with the divergent attitudes of men and their rebellions. That generation seemed to rebel in the same way, but it wasn't the same way. They would later go and Joshua would lead them. And, and, and when the, the river, you know, Joshua at the helm uh, goes to cross, God doesn't say, find the old staff of Moses and raise it and the river will part at the Jordan. No, God says to to Joshua, I want you to get the priests and the, and the ark, and I want, I want you to know that as soon as they finally step in the water, it will part. Totally different. It's the same, but it's different. He's going to part the water for you. He's going to bring you into the promised land, but it's not always going to be the same method. Don't get trapped in a methodology. Get anchored in the rock. Get anchored in in hearing his voice. Follow his spirit. Let's pray. Father, you are amazingly merciful and I love your foresight. God, you designed us for this moment, in this place, in this time. And I pray, God, that you would move, move in this body of believers. That under the sound of these ears, God, that you would move in hearts in a way that hasn't been moved. You would stir, stir up faith that maybe some thought was long lost or gone. And motivate us, God, to be acute hearers of your word, of your scriptures. And obedient, Father, not letting our emotions get to the point where we would hear what you ask us to do and then go and do something else. Lord, help us to... Minister to the generations that are coming after us in a way that is healthy, that will help them thrive and help them enter into the places where we never entered. Help us not to be a lid on your spirit, but to be a release, a pipe, a backwards funnel. 
I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.